Well, good morning. So apparently um, putting on a short sleeve button down and spiking your hair makes you look like Jimmy Neutron. So uh, have that image in your brain this morning. So glad you guys are here. Um, About six months ago, um, my family, we went over to, (laughs) now you're just picturing Jimmy Neutron. That's it. It's gone for the rest of the time this morning. Um, no. uh, so uh, six months ago, my family and I went on a trip. Uh, we decided that we were going to take a little vacation to um, Orlando. And uh, going to Orlando, um, we picked a hotel based off of one. They were offering um, fairly cheap rates for us to sit through a small little presentation, um, which you've probably all been to. Uh, it's called a timeshare thing. Um, at two was um, they had a water slide. And so stoked about the water slide that they had there. And so we bring our girls. And it was one of those water slides that actually didn't go into a pool. Never seen that before. But just kind of ended. And the kids got out. And then they went back up. And so um, we got there. And we go up the water slide. It's a little intimidating for a kid, I think. I mean, for me, I've been on water slides. But if you've never been on one before, I think it could be a little scary. And so Sayla, of course, goes down the slide. She was super pumped. Everly um, actually jumped on. Hope was super scared. She did not want to go down it, even though she saw her sisters go down it. Um, And so as a good dad as I am, I got down on one knee and looked at her face to face, you know. I'm like, hey, this is going to be so much fun. You're going to love the opportunity to go down this slide. This is why we're here. She would have nothing to do with it. She didn't want any part of that water slide. And so as a good dad as I am, I picked her up and I walked down the stairs with her. Because there's a lot of stairs to get up to some of those water slides. Walked all the way down, got to the bottom. And then I started trying to rationalize with her. Ever try to rationalize with a four-year-old? It doesn't go very well. And so we're, we're talking and um, just, just really trying to help shepherd her into this and trying to get the two other girls, Sayla and Everly, to tell her how much fun it was. And still, she wanted nothing to do with it. So, of course, as the good dad that I am, I said, well, I'm going to go down with you. And so I pick her up and I walk all the way up to the top of the stairs. But in my brain, I knew that one of the rules, because I read it on the sign, was that people couldn't go down together. And so um, I walked all the way up the stairs and got to the front of the line, and she was about to go, and, and um, she kept, you're going to go with me, you're going to go with me, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I said, you have to sit down first, and she's like, okay. And then so she, she started realizing about this time that, like, I don't think he's going to come down with me. And so, uh, so I took her, and I'm, like, starting to place her down, she's like, she just starts clawing at my neck and like at my back, and she's like not letting go, and she's like, you're not going to come, no, 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 put it, and of course, as a good dad as I am, I didn't want to force, no, I did, I forced her, and I just chucked her down this slide, right, so I pick, I'm just like, and, uh, and so I threw her down the slide, um, she ramped off the side, no, um, so I threw her down the side, and um, she loved it, she loved every second of it, and, and so she got to the bottom, and I think she was in shock, because she just kind of sat there, and then all of a sudden it was like, I want to go again, right? And she jumped out and then ran up and then could not pull that girl off that slide for the rest of the time. And so for us in life, last week, what we talked about is that we all have obstacles in life, all have these things that we have to overcome. And I know that that's kind of a jokey one and a funny one, but we do. We all experience these things in life where we have to overcome different obstacles. We have to overcome different things, whether it's finances, marriage, raising kids, uh, our jobs, um, getting jobs, losing jobs, uh, just all sorts of stuff that we experience in life. Uh, Disconnecting relationships, family relationships. Anybody ever struggle with a family relationship, right? Brother, sister, mom, dad, aunt, uncle. We just have these things, these obstacles all day that we have to overcome. And one of the things that we looked at last week was what does it look like in God's word to fix our eyes on Jesus? Fix our eyes on Jesus as we go through life because he is the one with the power to overcome every single obstacle. See, we know that history would tell us that Jesus was a real person. History says that Jesus was real. He was true. He existed. And C.S. Lewis talks about these uh, three different uh, trilemma that we experience with with believing who Jesus is. Either we can believe that Jesus is uh, a liar. He's just the greatest con artist of all time. He's a lunatic, or he was just flat out crazy. He really believed he was the Son of God, but he wasn't. Or he's exactly who he said he was. He is Lord of all, the Son of God. And so we have to begin to to 
look at the word of God and say, do we believe what this is saying is true? And then we're in Hebrews 11. So if you have a Bible, grab it, open up to Hebrews 11. And in Hebrews 11, we see this, what some call the wall of faith. Men and women in the Bible that are exalted or lifted up because of the tremendous faith that they had in Jesus. Now, before we we dive in, there's something we have to understand about Hebrews 11. Every single one of these people were sinners. I think sometimes we could read a list like this and think, I can never be like that. Well, Abraham, he was a liar. Jacob, he was a thief. David, he was a murderer and an adulteress. So all the people in this passage are sinners, just like you and me. They weren't perfect. They doubted over and over again. And they all faced obstacles of all different kinds. And so last week we read Hebrews 11, verses 23 through 31. And as we read it, we were dissecting a few things that happened. We see uh, in verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Anybody struggle with that obstacle in their life? Fleeting pleasures of sin. That's an obstacle we all have to endure and encounter every single day. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. Anybody have anything in their life that they tend to idolize? Things that uh, if for some reason we lost them or some reason uh, they were taken from us that our worlds would crumble? I feel that way with my my wife. I feel that way with my kids. If something ever happened to them, I I, I would just go into a hole. What some would call the pit of despair. Right? The the treasures of this world, the things of this world, our, our money, our houses, our finances, our cars, things that we can build up and make to be something that they shouldn't be. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king. Anybody experience fear and anxiety in your life? Anybody try to overcome that obstacle in life? I know some people, actually, that's a, that's a daily struggle. For some, it's, it's just a, a, a period of time. Fear, anxiety over, am I going to lose my job? Am I going to lose my home? Is, is this relationship not going to work out? What if I don't meet the right person? What if I'm, I'm alone the rest of my life? What if, what if, what if, what if? And that's one of the things that we saw in Moses' life. Throughout all of Moses' life, there were these shifts of faith that he began to experience. So when God called Moses, he was about 80 years old. He's in the wilderness, and he sees this burning bush. Everybody remember the story? And when he saw this burning bush, he goes up to it. It's not being consumed, and he hears the voice of the Lord. And God says, I'm going to send you back to free the people of Israel from Egypt because they were being oppressed by the people. They were in slavery. And he started saying, what if? But God, what if they ask me who sent me? What if they don't believe that you actually sent me? What if this? What if this? What if this? And somewhat reluctantly, he goes. And he goes before the Pharaoh, and he says, God says, let my people go. And you know what Pharaoh says? No. You ever do something in life where you believe God said, go, do something, and you go and do it, and then the outcome is not what you thought it was going to be? Anyone? Where you're like, you're like all right, I'm going to step out in faith, God. I'm going to do what, what, what I believe you're calling me to do. And then you get there, and things start to crumble. And you're like, then what does the question shift to? Not, not what if, but what? Why? Why? Why, God? You sent me all the way here to Florida. You sent me, you, you made me change jobs. You made me do this. You made me do that. Why? 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 And so that's what Moses started doing. Like, why, God, did you send me all the way here to Egypt to tell the Pharaoh something that he's just like, no. Like, it wasn't like a soft no. It was a hard no. So he's like, God, you sent me all the way here, and now all of a sudden, like, Why? But as God continued to do only what God can, which is to fulfill his plan and his time and his purpose, he began to shift again. And instead of saying what if, and instead of saying why, he started saying, what next? What next? Because his faith in the power of God began to grow. God, all right, I I saw you with those plagues. I saw you part the Red Sea. What's next? 
Not because I fully trust that you're going to do it, but because I've seen you do it. I've seen you at work. I've seen your power. I've seen what you can do. So instead of saying, what if? And instead of saying, why? Now I'm just going to be like, all right, God, what next? What next? Because I trust you. Not my ability, not the people around me, but you. And what does the Bible say? He fixed his eyes on Jesus. Look at verse 27. Not, um, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He endured. He kept going. He fixed his eyes on the one who he knew was going to fulfill his purpose and his plan in his timing. So since we all face obstacles in life, and we all are going to experience many things for the rest of our lives, hey, congratulations, if you didn't know that, there it is. You are going to experience obstacles for the rest of your life. They're never going to go away. No matter how much you build around you, no matter how cushy your life is, no matter how much money you have, you will always face obstacles. Good news? All right, we're going to wrap up right there. No, but what do we see here? When we face obstacles, what's the solution? What do we see in verse 27? We fix our eyes on Jesus. The word picture here are blinders on a horse. A horse can see 360 degrees around them. And they put blinders on them so it fixes their eyes ahead of them. Because if not, the things that are behind them and on the side of them will scare them and freak them out to where they will go off course. And so the idea is to fix our eyes on the one thing that is true, the one thing is right, that is straight in front of us, which is Jesus. And then what do we see? Well, over and over again in this passage, and this is going to be an overarching uh, discussion that we're going to have based off of Hebrews 11. There's something that we've seen that we haven't dove, dove into yet, but this is what I want to talk about today. And this is what we're going to, we're actually going to do uh, some interviews and some conversations with a few different people. Um, and so what we're going to do is look at all of Hebrews 11, and one of the things we see is that there's an overarching theme about the people of God. And here it's the people of Israel, but when we see that Jesus came, he created for himself a people that was not only the people of Israel, the Jews, but also the Gentiles. And so over the whole course of the Bible, we see that God has created a people for himself. And so sometimes we need the family that's around us to push us. Kind of like I <laughs> pushed hope down the slide. So that we can overcome the obstacles that we experience and that we face in this world. God has not only given us Jesus as someone to fix our eyes onto, but he's also given us a family to help us fix our eyes on Jesus. There are many people in this room that have helped me over the last numerous years continue to fix my eyes on Jesus that have reminded me, Bill, I know you want to do something, but man, keep doing what Jesus has called you to do. I can look at Britt, I can look at Randy, I look at Billy, I can look at Mark, I can see people that, that have continually said to me over and over again, just fix your eyes on Jesus. That's why God gives us the family, people to do life with so that we can enjoy this world and enjoy these things and all ultimately overcome the obstacles in our life. So there's a solution to the obstacles we face in life. First solution, fix our eyes on Jesus. Second one is live life in his family. Not in a way where you're just attending a family, like kind of popping into, you know, the family reunion once every five years, but actually living life in the family, doing life together. And so the question is how? And so we have a mission here at FMCC. Um, hopefully you know it by now, but it is love God, love others, and make disciples. That is the how to fixing our eyes on Jesus, and that is the how on living life in the family. What we desire is to be the type of people that would love God deeply in our lives, that we would have a personal relationship with him, and that we would, as an overflow of that relationship that we have with God, that we would learn to love one another. Not only those inside of the family, but those outside of the family. And that we would then go and make disciples. People who know and love God. And know that there is a God out there that desires a relationship with him. And so I'm going to invite up Kara. So let's hear it for Kara. Ben, I got your coffee here. I'm going to drink it. 
Here we go. Kara, welcome. Thanks. Let's hear it for Kara again. <laughs> so pumped. Um, so I wanted to just to have a quick conversation. I know that this whole topic can be intimidating, right? So when we look at specifically loving God, so where do we get this from? First, first and foremost, we see that when Jesus was here, someone questioned him, and they said, what's the greatest commandment, right? Should I not commit adultery? Should I not murder? Um, and his response was, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mm-hmm. Um, and, so, and then he said, the second is like it, love others. Right. Um, and so this, this first part, um, for you in your own life, um, when did loving God, a personal relationship with God, when did that all start to make sense and why? Sure. Um, well, small caveat, this is me being pushed down the water slide. So <laughs> <laughs> if I stumble, sorry. <laughs> but, um, so I tend to be a pusher. <laughs> okay, it's a good thing. Um, but I would say, I like in thinking about this question, it really, like the moment that stands out to me or the period that stands out to me is a time um, right around the end of college when I was just exhausted. Mm-hmm. Like we talked a lot about, especially in um, our Galatians study and throughout just the life of the church, how um, we can sometimes tend to rely on the law mm-hmm. um, for salvation, for sanctification, for whatever it may be, misplacing kind of our identity and our focus and our heart on the law. And so on on one end, like that's kind of what I was doing. It's what I grew up in. It was like um, God was like some great taskmaster, you Mm -hmm. know, like you accept Jesus into your heart and now you do these things and you don't do these things. Mm. Um, And that was exhausting. (laughs) Um, And so I kind of laid that down. Um, But then it came to a point where I was trying to be everything that everyone said I should be, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is what culture does to us all the time. And that was exhausting. (laughs) And I remember very vividly um, on a Saturday night just being like, there has to be more than this. Like, Mm. this cannot be it. Um, And I remember being in a community where I had a couple of really close friends who loved the Lord and had a joy. And I was like, why is that different Mm. for them? And it's not that way for me. Like, I'm tired. I don't like it. I feel like I'm always failing. Like, I'm never going to get it, you know, um, like, yeah, I'll go to heaven because I said yes to Jesus, but what do I do in between now and then mm-hmm. kind of a thing. So it just, there was this just longing for something more and something different than what I had experienced and been taught to that point. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, you know, we see this, uh, this thing in our culture that has, uh, this, in, this um, we're enamored with progress and performance, mm. just as a culture as a whole. Mm-hmm. And it really causes us in some ways within the church to put on masks, mm-hmm. to act like we have it all together, to mm-hmm. act like we know what we're doing, um, when actually the, the, the good news of the gospel is an admission to the fact that we don't have it all together, mm-hmm. which, is, which is completely counter to what I kind of grew up in uh, I grew up in New York in the church um, and uh, all different types. So it wasn't just one specific denomination. It was all different types. Um, I went like Catholic to Pentecostal. Like, so, I mean, it was just this, this plethora of, of church experience that was all about um, looking like I had my act together. Right. Looking like I had, but when really I was just a mess inside. And we see Jesus actually go against that. We see Jesus um, say, you know, uh, you Pharisees, you keepers of the law, you continually clean the outside of the cup when the inside is dirty. Um, And so uh, that was what this experience has been. Um, So what did you learn about God's love for you that changed your desire to love him? So this is the cool part (laughs) (laughs) that I'm still learning every day. Um, but really, so I struggled with, and I feel like we've talked about this too, but I've struggled with, um, God is father Mm -hmm. because my dad was not a very good one. (laughs) Um, he made promises and then broke them. So I couldn't trust him. Mm -hmm. He wasn't always there. So again, no trust, like no faith in my dad and him being a dad, like his dadness. (laughs) Um, so, (laughs) so kind of translating that. To God, because it was the only example that I had, you know, and people kept talking about God as Father, God as Father, God as Father. Um, 
Also, I was not encouraged to go look for things myself in the Bible, so there was that. Yeah. But <laughs> um, so I just really struggled with like how I don't. My dad's love was not the kind of love mm. that I wanted. It was a kind of love that was hurtful. It was a kind of love that let me down. Yeah. Um, and so that combined with the whole like God is taskmaster or scorekeeper or whatever, yeah. just it was just not a good picture yeah. at all. Um, but I think learning. Um, about what God's unconditional love is, mm. is what did it for me. Because um, in, in, uh, even in between like John 3.16, the famous, you know, mm -hmm. God to love the world that he gave his only begotten son, all that. Um, and what we were just talking about with love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, that love word has the same root. And it's really cool when you look it up because it talks about pursuit. Mm. Like and longing and understanding that God wasn't saying, like, I'm loving, I love you, so I'm going to give you all these rules and do these rules and you'll be fine. He's saying, I love you, and I'm going to relentlessly pursue you mm, so that so you good. can enjoy me, which is what's best for you, yeah. and live in that. Oh, like, God. it doesn't matter if you keep this rule or that rule. In fact, you're probably going to break them all. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still here. I'm still chasing oh. after you, and I long to be with you. Like, yeah. that's why John 3, 16 exists. Like, I was longing for a relationship with yeah. you. I was pursuing you so much that this is what I did. And just knowing that, like, God wants me. Mm. Like, just me. <laughs> Not the stuff I can do or the rules I can keep or how many Bible verses I memorize or how many times I go to church in a week mm -hmm. sort of a thing. Like he just wants me. Mm -hmm. That's it right now yeah. where I am. Yeah. Like I am the object of his affection. Yeah. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So that was like revolutionary yeah. um, to go from somebody who's like the teacher standing with the ruler, like, ah, you didn't do that, you yeah. know, <laughs> to uh, somebody who's like, I am chasing after you because you are my most prized possession uh. and I want to be with you. I want to be in your, like you to be in my presence. I want us to be together, to be one. Like, Amen. what? <laughs> That's all I can, I just, it's, it's amazing. That's like mic drop. <laughs> just, just go ahead and, man, so good. <laughs> Um, so last thing, yeah. um, because so new mom, yeah. working mom, yeah. um, all moms <laughs> are working moms. So yes. you're, 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 you're in your, you have a full-time job. You have yeah. a full-time job as a mom, yeah. you're a wife, um, <laughs> you have a ministry to people in the community and life and, um, how, um, like what does a relationship with God look like as you try to juggle life? Sure. Because I think that that's one of the things that we get into, like when we talk about loving God, it's like, man, I just don't have time, or I don't, <laughs> mm -hmm. so, I, and I, I'm not saying that we do it perfectly, but what does that just kind of look like in mamahood and right. all these things when you're trying to wake up 10 times in the middle of the night, yeah. you're exhausted all the time? Um, <laughs> so, um, it's tough, mm. but it's, it's tough regardless, mm. you know, because we're constantly bombarded with things that are telling, like, that are giving us a perverted view of what love is, what we're here for, what our relationships with other people, and even with God should be. Um, and those come so freely that we have to be super intentional about counteracting those with the truth. <laughs> um, and if we don't, it's really easy, I fail all the time, to um, fall short of that, to yeah. not enjoy the Lord the way that he calls us to and the way that's best for us and everyone around us kind of a thing. So, um, it's funny, I talked to Lauren about this <laughs> um, a while ago, just how I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, I used to have this routine, and I would, like, really enjoy some, like, prayer time or some devotional time or worship time or whatever it may be. Like, I had time. Yeah. <laughs> I had time. <laughs> and, uh, now I don't. I see a lot of smiling moms. They're like, yes. Because <laughs> there's this little man who's wonderful and who is a gift and who is so precious that's like, no, no, I want it all. He's a time sucker. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so it really, for me at least, it looks like kind of getting it in where I can. Yeah. Like, my commute to work is seriously like six minutes in the morning, but I might be listening to a podcast. I might be um, praying for the day because mm -hmm. every day needs prayer over here. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, and one really cool thing, um, especially early on that the Lord was so sweet and gracious. Um, I had time, like Franz gets up super early in the morning, goes to work. I'm left with Gavin for like an hour and a half before I go to work. And um, we've gotten it down to a routine where, like, I just have this time where I can 
usually, um, <laughs> fill it with whatever I want. And while like it might not be like a quiet time where I'm like sitting on my couch with a cup of coffee and just like <laughs> leisurely going through the word. Feed up your journal app. Right? Yeah. Like I'm reading mm-hmm. my scripture to Gavin mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. or, you know, things like that. So mm-hmm. it's, it changes. And I think it's a frustrating thing because I like routine, but it's also a beautiful thing mm-hmm. that like loving God um, and enjoying him, experiencing that like joyful dependence mm-hmm. um, on him is something that can be done in five minutes if you have five minutes, Mm. in an hour if you have an hour. Mm. Um, It can look like so many different things because of who God is. And that's the beautiful thing. And it's been a while, it's it's taking a while for me to like chip away at what, again, I felt like it was supposed to look like. (laughs) And God's saying, no, I can meet with you right now while you're doing dishes. Because Lord, I do dishes all the time. (laughs) All these bottles, it's insane. Dishes and laundry. Right? (laughs) So... Those sorts of things. And it's, yeah. it's, it's sweet in a different way. Yeah. You know, when you have time, hours, 15 minutes, whatever it is, that can be really, really sweet. Yeah. And but the perspective you... of um, God wanting, that you talked mm-hmm. about before, like God wanting to be with you. Right. Like so in his, cool. him, his pursuit of you yeah. does, like having that perspective does make you want to in those little moments mm-hmm. pursue him versus just checking out on Netflix mm-hmm. or YouTube or right. whatever can consume your time. I do do that, full well, yeah. disclosure, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, cool. it's, it's beautiful to I'll be able to meet it. with him in that way. So, so cool. Yeah. Let's hear it for Kara. <laughs> awesome. Love to invite up Lauren. Let's hear it for Lauren. Full disclosure, this is my wife, so if you see me flirting with her, I am. Um, I love, uh, one of the things I told her, uh, one of the things I love most in our lives is just being able to do ministry together, um, do life together. Uh, it's so much fun. And so, and I love how different our personalities are in, in some of these kinds of things. I, um, I, I threw some notes together and sent it out to them and um, she's like sitting there like manuscripting and writing things out and like researching and I'm like right, let's just have a conversation so like I called I called Mark and he's like yeah don't even tell me the questions we'll just like talk um, but uh, with Lauren like and I love how diligent you are at um, studying the word and being in the word and um, in the midst of the chaos as Kara was sharing um, so. you don't want to hear my dissertation on loving others no I would love to you have a great <laughs> dissertation um, so uh I told her I may vary from the script, and then she said, don't do that. Um, So, uh, (laughs) I love it. Um, So how, for you, how does understanding your identity in Christ impact your love and interaction with others? So now we're shifting from loving God, the relationship we have with God, to that overflowing now into relationship with others. So how do you, um, your identity, what piece does that play in loving others? Yeah, um, I'd say living into my identity is a daily battle. Um, anybody else? Uh, especially as a mom and a wife and all of those things. Um, because the enemy and the world works really hard um, to keep me from living into the fullness of who I am in Christ. Um, and so, because the enemy knows that um, that my understanding of who I am in Christ um, will impact every single aspect of my life. And so if the enemy can mess with my identity um, today, then it's a good day mm. for him. And so um, as the women, we're going through a book, and it's all about our identity. And um, this, the first chapter has us memorizing Galatians 5.1, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And I've been really um, thinking about what this means in my own life. Um, And it it also made me think of um, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. And this is really our identity. Um, So many verses and uh, so many verses in scripture speaks to our identity. Um, But this one I just love. um, And it says, uh, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Um, Once you were a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
Um, and so I can't proclaim this to others um, when I'm not living into it. Um, so when I forget that um, I'm chosen, when I forget that I am called out of darkness, um, when I forget I'm his daughter, um, when I forget that I have received mercy, um, then I tend to open up myself um, to all of the lies the enemy throws at me mm. um, throughout the day. Um, and so my identity becomes forgotten. And so I begin to strive, kind of like what Kara was talking about. I, I begin to strive to um, be better at all of the things, um, to prove myself um, and to do it out of my own strength. Um, and so um, it also reminds me that I have hope to offer other people. And so this is kind of in loving others. Um, you have to remember that I know the source of life. Mm. Um, I have that hope. And so um, I think that that fuels my love and my interaction for others. Hmm. That's good. And love is, um, so I think culturally love can be so distorted um, of what it is, what people believe it is. I think sometimes a lot of people can think love is this foofy, surreal, um, you know, very um, airy thing. Um, but there's so much substance to what love is. And ultimately what Scripture says, 1 Corinthians um, 13, that talks about um, that God actually defines love. Love doesn't define God. Um, it's kind of that perspective shift that Kara was talking about, is that when we begin to project what we think love is onto God, because they say he is the essence of love, then we misunderstand who God is. Um, and so, but, but God is this definition of love, and love is um, both support, it's this high support, um, but it's also a challenge. And I think that as a culture, in some ways, we, uh, we've removed the challenge out of love. Um, I was actually just talking to one of the young guys in our church um, in the back, and, and anytime someone around us begins to challenge us, um, we can like be defensive, right, and stand off. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing um, when it is in love. And God has actually surrounded us with a family that gets to both support us but also challenge us, um, and that, that is good. And so what does love loving others and supporting and challenging look like? Like, how do you juggle that? That's off script. I'm I sorry. know. <laughs> you promised. <laughs> um, well, you're, you, I, I mean, I, this is okay. maybe uh, bias okay. on we'll my part. We'll talk later. It's yeah. fine. No. <laughs> uh. um, oh, this is bias on my part, but I think that's something that you do so well. Mm. And I know that the, the people that know you, like you, you love well in support, but you also love well in challenge. Um, and so, yeah, that has been, um, part of my sanctification. Um, I didn't always love well and challenge. I, um, I had a really hard time meeting, um, truth with love, um, for a very long time. And that's something that God continues to grow me in. Um, but, but it is so true. It is so important. I think when I look at scripture and I see, you know, we want to look at Jesus' example, right? And so of how he loved when he was here on earth. And so when I look at scripture, I see him love in three ways. Um, and um, the first is that he slowed down with people. Um, we see him do this all the time. Um, when he lived on earth, um, we see him be utterly spent for people. Um, which is something that the Lord is also continuing to teach me. Um, but there is this aspect of he is constantly speaking truth to people. Yeah. And so I think this is the part that sets us apart from the world. And so I, I know a lot of unbelievers, non-believers, who um, they slow down with people really well. I know a lot of unbelievers who um, really serve and they are spent for people. Um, but the difference between what we have to offer is we have truth to offer. And so whenever Jesus was um, talking to the people, and um, one of the ways he loved others was that he was continually pointing people um, to the Father. He was continually pointing people um, to be kingdom-minded. And so um, this is something that is a really hard thing to do because it takes 
um, it takes boldness, mm. um, but I think it really does take understanding of, um, again, who we are in Christ and what we have to offer. And so um, I love in John 15, 11, um, he gives us the reason for why why we are to do these things, why we are to love God, why we are to love others. But he says, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Mm. And so if, if I know for myself, my joy is full in Christ, and why wouldn't I want that for others, mm. right? And so I think that it's very easy for me to take out Katie or um, any of you, any any woman that I've been meeting with, and it'd be one thing for me to, you know, spend my time and spend um, just whatever, spend, be spent for her and to slow down with her. But if I'm not also accompanying that with the truth of God's word, then am I really loving you? Like, am I really loving her? Mm. Um, and so I think that that is a piece that as believers um, who know truth, you know, in our, in our culture today, truth all, it's relative, right? What's true for me doesn't necessarily have to be true for you, right? Wrong. <laughs> There is, there is an absolute truth. And if we know it, and if we love that person, then why wouldn't we speak that mm. to them um, over and over? Um, that is our purpose. So we need to give others reason for why we love like we do. Mm. Yeah. And it has to be real for us, right? It's, if Absolutely. we're not loving God and we don't understand our relationship with God, then it's not real. Yeah, for sure. Um, and um, it's kind of like that old uh, an- analogy of a, a truck coming to hit somebody that you love. Like, it's one thing to yell and say, hey, you know, a truck's coming. But if they don't move and they don't believe you, what do you do? You know, do you run after them? Do you push them out of the way? Um, are you going to go that far for the people that you love? Knowing that that hell is a real thing mm-hmm. um, and that um, our sin is real. Yeah, eternity and so is at we, stake, yeah. we are born enemies of God. Mm-hmm. And God loved us so much that, as Kara said, he sent his son to to die for us so that we may have a restored relationship with him. If we truly believe that enemies of God will spend eternity apart from God in a place called hell, how would we be loving them by not telling them? Especially, I mean, the the statistics are staggering. About 30% of people in our population here in Southwest Florida would consider going to a church on a given Sunday, about 30%. That statistic grows from 30% to 70% in two times a year, Christmas and Easter, that they would actually consider, like 70% of the people that you know in your life would actually consider joining you to go to church knowing that you are going to church. Um, that's a staggering statistic. And so I, my hope would be is that we as a people would go and share good news with people and share about Jesus with them. Um, but that also means of us inviting them to be a part of the family because some people desire to belong before they believe, and other people believe before they belong. And so it's understanding that there are people in your lives that may be open in this season to come and be a part of things. Um, Last thing, um, and then we're going to, real quick, what part does intentionality play in how you schedule relationships and invest in others? Because um, I know your life, and it, from the out from the inside, looks exhausting. Um, so four kids, mamahood, like all the things that you do in life and community, and um, how does intentionality play in that? Hmm. Um, I, I think that I have to come to recognize how important it is um, before, because I think I can make excuses all day long um, for why I don't have time. <laughs> Uh, or why I'm just so tired. Valid excuses. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Valid excuses. <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, when we go back to that Matthew 22 passage, and he is talking, and the Pharisees are questioning Jesus, and he's saying um, the greatest commandment um, is to love God, and the second one is like it, love um, your neighbor as yourself. Um, and then he talks about, he says, um, like, everything hinges on these two commandments. On these two commandments, um, the law and prophets, like everything, the entirety of the Bible um, hinges, hangs on doing these two things. Mm. 
And so if I truly understand that that is so, so important, um, then it's going to compel me to make time to love others. And so um, for me in my life right now, it looks like slowing down with people um, on my couch, in my kitchen, <laughs> uh, my dirty, very dirty kitchen, um, going to Starbucks when my sweet husband lets me um, and meet with women, um, slowing down doing that. Um, and so I think that it's just, I, I am a texting fiend. I, I think I can be talking to like 25 people at one time. <laughs> I think I've just gotten really good at it um, because I'm, you know, I'm not necessarily in face to face with them all the time. Um, but I think it's following up and um, entering into people's world. Um, and so again, this is what Jesus did so well. He, I mean, he, he actually did it. <laughs> he, he came down, entered into our world, yeah, and um, he wept. He, hurt. I mean, all of the, he hurt. He, he took on our humanness in, 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 in entirety, like yeah. completely. And so um, I think that that is also a way um, that we can, we can do this. Um, John 15, 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Yeah. We have to look at his example of how he loved um, and so I am, when I recognize and understand that I am completely and fully loved by God, it fuels me to love others, my kids and others um, outside of, of my family and my kids. And so, and my husband, of course. <laughs> love it. Let's hear it for Lauren. All right. Last but not least, Mark. Let's hear it for Mark. All right, so I'm not allowed to just go off script, so there you go. Um, and then I would just say this, it was so cool because last week when you were preaching, I really felt like there was something that I wanted to share, mm -hmm. and I was just like, well, I'm not going to be weird if I'm like, go up on stage, <laughs> uninvited, <laughs> and then later in the week, Bill's like, hey, would you want to speak on this? And it was exactly what I felt like the Lord was sharing to me last, uh, last Sunday, and um and so, I don't know if you just want go, me to share. Go, just go, so, yeah. So, Bill, who was here last Sunday? Like, yeah. a lot. if you weren't here, I should ask who's not here. Um, Bill shared this analogy of this high ropes course. And just standing up on a platform, if any of you guys have ever done it, you literally stand and you jump. And um, I was thinking of it, and I was like, yeah, it's easy to jump if you've seen other people jump. Hmm but it's not easy to jump if you're the first person to test it or if you're the one who tied the rope or put up a pulley or if you're putting all of your faith in something. And I was just thinking of the people in my life who I'm challenging now to take the leap of faith. And I was thinking, I was like, man, if they've never seen anyone else do that, it would be the same of you going up there as the first one, not watching anyone else jump mm -hmm. off this high ropes course and just trusting, okay, this thing's going to catch me only because someone's told me it has. Yeah. But when we as Christians live our lives out like Lauren sharing and like Kara shared, then we set the example for other people so that when they see us take that leap of faith, our lives are the example for them to, to have that confidence in. Mm. And I was thinking about Hebrews and all of these other men that we have as Christians to look at their lives and their, their example and God's faithfulness. And we have the ability to say, okay, I've I believe that God is faithful because I've seen him be faithful in the lives of other people and just how our lives, we get that chance to do that. Hmm. And um, just like a slide or just like anything that's silly, even skydiving, I mean, I, I can't imagine the first person who ever jumped with a parachute, <laughs> but now, like, I've been skydiving twice, and, like, I have full faith in the parachute because it's like I'm, like, with an instructor strapped to him. I'm like, this guy's not going to die. Like, he's going to, he's going to, he's done this before, and so... Um, I think that there is a, a confusion with simplicity and easiness. And I think our church does such a good job at keeping things simple with love God, love others, make disciples. But I think that making disciples is actually hard. <laughs> and it's just because it's simple, it doesn't mean that it's easy. And, um, and so I was just thinking about that last week. And... Um, yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, what no, that's great. But, um, um, it, so in this passage, if you're still in Hebrews 11, um, 
and this is, this is kind of the thing that I was really excited about coming into loving God, loving others, and making disciples. Uh, look at, uh, so we just read 24, so Hebrews 11, 24 through 27. So this, Hebrews um, 11, 23 through 28, is talking about Moses and his leadership, right? So Moses uh, continually asks, what if, what if, what if? Then he says, why, why, why? And then he just starts going, all right, God, now what? Like, what do you have for us? And so parts of the Red Sea, wandering in the wilderness, they're hungry, manna falls from the sky, quail falls from the sky, uh, we're thirsty, you know, gets water out of a rock, still journeying with these whiny, complaining people, but still continue. God says, go up the mountain, he goes up the mountain, gives them the Ten Commandments, right? So, so he's living this out now in the now what? And there are people that are watching him, just like you said, right? There are people that are watching him continually lead by faith, um, seeing him doubt, 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 doubt. And then all of a sudden there's this shift of like, okay, God is powerful. Like I, like, I probably need to stop questioning him as much as just saying, all right, God, what do you need me to do? Um, and so then from verse 28, it says, if you're with me, uh, 1128, by faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. This is talking about the part in scripture where the final plague that's being done in the land of Egypt is that God was going to send the angel of death through and he was going to kill the firstborn son unless the doorposts or the um, areas of their house, that the entrance of their house, the doorposts were sprinkled with blood uh, of sacrifice, right, which is a symbolization now for the blood of Jesus and how that's sprinkled over us as believers. Um, and that, that right there in verse 28 is actually not only Moses. Moses didn't go around sprinkling blood on everybody else. At that point, all of the Israelites were still questioning Moses. But as Moses walked out in faith in front of these people, now all of a sudden you've got Israelites that are sprinkling blood of, of lambs on their doorposts. I mean, that's not the, I know we're thinking about painting our house soon, and if I suggested to put blood on our doorposts, my wife would be like, no, right? So, um, but that's, right? So he's now, by living out this faith in front of the people, they're now joining him in this thing, right? Then they complain and want in the wilderness a bunch. But then they're about to enter in the promised land. Verse 29, by faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. And when the Egyptians went to do the same, they were drowned. Verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. Now, if we just read through that, we can miss the fact that Moses is no longer alive. Right? So Moses is now dead. The people are in the wilderness. And a new leader is raised up, Joshua. Joshua, all of a sudden, is like, Hey, let's go. God said to go to the promised land. Let's go to the promised land. And so, like, they take off running, and they're like, oh, there's a body of water. And Joshua's like, well, duh. Like, well, God will part it. Like, and because he did that to the Red Sea, he's going to do that to the Jordan. And so he parts it. And then he goes in, and they're like, oh, there's big walls. And he's like, God, what do we do? Like, and all of a sudden now, the impact that Moses had on Joshua's life was huge um, in how he did, discipled him, right? So what do you, what do you just... Yeah, I would just... I, th I think that faith is contagious. Hmm. And so when when these people who Moses is leading, when they see him step out in faith, they follow him. And 29 says they, they, the people crossed the Red Sea, you know, like they followed his lead. And then um, they walk around Jericho seven times looking like fools, I'm sure. And I would assume like they were, they were being threatened and mm -hmm. there was lots of things. And so it's, I do believe that faith is contagious. And when we step out in faith, it gets easier for us, and it gets more believable for others. Yeah. And um, and what I asked Bill uh, on last Sunday, I said, man, would, would you have been scared to jump off that platform the second time? And he was just like, not as scared, you know. And then the third time would have been easy at the fourth time. After a while, you wouldn't have any fear, mm. and, and faith becomes easier and easier. And when we see God be faithful over and over and over it becomes less fearful. The question of why or what if starts to fade away. Mm. And, um, and even for, for us, like my wife and I, we're in full-time ministry, and we've been in ministry now for 10 years, that, that when we first started, I had a lot of whys and what ifs. <laughs> and now it's just like, well, I've seen God prove himself faithful for so long that now the whys and what ifs don't become they're in the back of my mind, you know, they're not that, or they're not in the back of my mind, they're, they still they're, happen, they do, totally, but it just, cha it shifts, it Your changes, perspective shifts. And, and I think that, that for us, that we have that challenge 
to take those leaps of faith for other people to see. Mm. And in the loving God, I, you know, this is such a silly analogy, but even in how happy Kara was, mm. you know, and laughing is like, the loving God is, I feel like um, it's easier, you know, than the loving others. That, that because of what God's done for us, our love for him is so easy to receive. But our loving others looks like stepping out in faith and mm. jumping when we someone tells us or the bible tells us that that god's going to catch us and we say well like what if he won't or you yeah. know now what and um and that's where the reality of our faith the river meets the road it's when we actually start to practice what we preach and say oh i believe this and so it's like it has to play out in our lives and when we do then discipleship, I really believe, is is a consequence of that. Mm. And, and so as Lauren shares, it's like actually taking the time to love people. Well, by loving people, we do make disciples. Yeah. And and because we are loving God and we are loving others, that discipleship happens mm. as a result. <clears throat> and um, But it is, I just, I, I, I see it and I feel it in my own life. It is hard at times to just be like, all right, God, I trust you. And I'm letting go. And even even today, I was reading this morning in, in Luke, and, and Jesus is talking about the co- the cost of discipleship. Mm-hmm. And and that discipleship has a cost. And, and this is what he says at the end. It says, Luke uh, 14, 33, he says, Therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. And I was just thinking about that in that same analogy of jumping off that platform. It's, it's literally letting go of everything, mm-hmm. total surrender, renouncing everything, and just jumping and God will catch us, and he yeah. says that he will, and he promises he will, and we have the testimonies of, of hundreds of thousands of people who he's done it, and our lives become that same testimony to other people, and um, and it does get easier, I think, if you're in a season of, of being afraid of jumping and renouncing everything, that, that Jesus is better. Yeah. He's better than holding on, and when you let go, you realize that Jesus is better, and the next situation that comes along where you're asked to jump it's easier and easier, and, um, but it is it is really, and I'm I'm just seeing it. I had a friend at my house yesterday who is not a believer, and the the thought of renouncing everything is so scary. Mm. And I just keep coming back to that analogy. I'm like, yeah, of course it is, man. You've <laughs> never done it, like, yeah. it, of course it's scary, and um, that's why we have to keep doing it, is so yeah. that other people aren't as scared. Yeah, it's a daily. I mean, it's a yeah. daily admission of our own death. Every day. Um, and so the outcome of all of this, everything we're talking about, truly is this gospel impact on our world and the world around us. Yeah. I mean, that's the outcome of us loving God, loving others, making disciples, is, is, is God's name is glorified in our world, in our world, and then in the world around us. Um, Mark, would you pray for us? I'm going to invite the band to come back on up. I'm going to pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for... Uh, just the example that you set for us to live and that you've given us the spirit that gives us the ability to step out in faith. And we know that in and of our own strength, we're unable to do anything. Um, God, that we need you. Um, We're dependent on you. God, we ask that you continue to fill us with your spirit every day, um, that that through the surrender of our lives, that, that we can love others and love you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength that we can make disciples. God, we pray for open doors in our relationships with people in our community, with friends and family, God, that that our lives will be a light into a dark world, and um, Lord, that we will point people back to you. Uh, We just love you, we thank you, and praise you. In your name we pray, amen.